So actually, I would like to stay and listen to your presentation. I yeah. am uh, so, but I will have to leave because I am uh, very dizzy uh, from uh, all of these uh, live from workshops. But I will uh, see your session Excellent. Uh, afterwards, and uh, I have uh, to with me now. Um, Manas, that he will be your okay. host. He's okay, uh, nice. part of our staff. Okay. And he will uh, be your host. Uh, Thank you. Uh, on the other side, uh, yes, uh, I, it's a very good, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, yeah. I know your work. I am uh, in, based in Barcelona. Okay. And uh, work uh, with uh, my friends like uh, from open source beehives and from other projects that probably you are interconnected. And um, I'm also uh, working a lot on biomaterials, so I know the, the work of uh, Katarina oh, nice. as well. Nice. So basically, uh, yes, I, I, I have been trying to reach out to her for a long time uh, for other things, yeah. other things than the things that you are currently doing. But um, anyway, I hope that we can yeah. uh, keep, in, keep in touch. And, um, yeah, I, will, I yeah. will contact you afterwards. Because uh, yeah, I wanted to follow up. I think you've got some either architecture or fabrication projects for collaborative enterprise development happening in Barcelona. There was some initiative I just saw. I don't know if you're connected to that. Was it around housing or was it around fabrication, like a, like an open source fab lab kind of a style thing? Uh, give me a sec. Or let's just let's hit it. We're we're ready to start. And sorry, because they, they yeah. are, uh, yeah. yeah. So basically we have uh, currently, on, uh, we had, uh, uh, it closed uh, like uh, the annual distributed design uh, platform competition. Uh, it's a project that is going very well where people mm -hmm. can uh, like uh, put their projects and then the, they have to have like, uh, they, get, they need to be shareable, they need to be open source, they need to, so it's a uh, we had some kind of like uh, 200 entries on that and now i think that they are um, judging the project we have various projects i mean i have also personal uh project with uh, earth ships and fab labs in rural places so i think that uh, i will just think you at some moment when yeah definitely not now because now it's eight so yeah, Saying that, I will uh, first. I will make uh, uh, Manas. I will make you co-host. I will admit all the participants, and right. then I will go uh, live on Facebook. So, yeah. hola, hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Do I have actually any control? Hello. Let's see. Ah, okay. Hello. 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 So, am I ready to start? Give me a second. I will start. I will introduce. And Manas, you can uh, hear me and you can uh, speak as well. So you will, um, it will be from, uh, yes, yeah, from Open Source College. So, uh, hello everyone. We are very happy uh, to host uh, this uh, session uh, now, uh, the third day of our Fabric Live conference, uh, with uh, Marcin 
Jeff Kubowski. Uh, it's called Extreme Enterprise, how to create an open source hardware enterprise in a weekend. Yes. And um, so uh, Martin is from Open Source Ecology. He has a lot of experience uh, with various projects and uh, of the open source movement. And we hope that he will uh, guide you through and you will be able to interact with him in this yeah. uh, session. So hello, Marcin. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. So ready to start? Okay. And you can hear me. Okay. Okay, well, welcome everybody. So my name is Marcin, founder of Open Source Ecology. I've been working on the Global Village construction set for the last decade already. If you're not familiar with the project, just a quick overview, Open Source Blueprints for Civilization. This is all the 50 different machines that it takes to make a modern life with modern comforts, everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker. It's a fully open source platform. Uh, but more than a technological development, I would really call it a humanitarian or social development because in order to get the collaborative development, you need to learn to collaborate. So that's the big thing because there's a lot of limits to what collaboration does today. Uh, the world is highly proprietary. In my own PhD program, as I studied, I could not talk openly about my work, for example because we had some hot material in our work. I, I studied fusion energy and I, I thought, wow, this is pretty wasteful. What, it would, what would it look like if we truly collaborated with one another to solve bigger problems, to make a better world for everybody? And given that the scientific field I was getting into didn't do it for me, I decided to start the Open Source Ecology Project and I've been working on that since, since um, I graduated in 2004. So that's been over a decade. I got landed on in a Missouri factory farm in 2006. Uh, 2011, uh, okay, so if you haven't he heard about this work yet, do take a look at my four minute TED talk on the Global Village construction set. That's the best overview in four minutes. So what I'll do today <coughs> is talk about our progress to date. So what have we learned over all this uh, time of prototyping? Because we've done a bunch of work, lots of proofs of concepts and real builds, many of them. So what do we do? Results to date. All, all the proofs of concept that we have done to date on rapid crowd-based open hardware development and builds. This is not just development, it's real builds with a lot of people swarming on, on collaborative build projects. So what are the opportunities and limits there? And then I'm going to discuss the, the missing link, which we have not gotten to yet, and that is the enterprise aspect, the, the concept of extreme enterprise, the one missing link. The idea here is that uh, in some way, open hardware has not succeeded, well, like software, clearly. Um, open source software, Linux, is the backbone of the internet. The same thing's going to happen with hardware but it hasn't happened yet. Why not? We've been at this game for a long time and we're really trying to understand the question like what does it really take and, and our latest conclusion on this is we got to get to the product level, uh, develop products that change people's lives right now. So here's our latest plan of how to do it. So first I'll, I'll start with what we have done to date. So we've prototyped a bunch of machines since 2008. Uh, so this kind of represents a bunch of stuff until 2013, which then I lost track, but hundreds of machines around the world um, with these milestones. So first of all, we found out, okay, we published the plans of our compressed earth block press, and we found that people can just download our plans and replicate. So this is actually the first ever replication in 2008 of a 2,000 of pound brick press that produces bricks from raw soil. Um, we found that by documenting our work and including pretty good documentation like IKEA style fabrication diagrams, people could replicate this stuff. Great. Awesome. Um, but we design with radical modularity in mind. So we've actually proven out some very efficient ways that modularity can get you to very rapid builds um, by the concept of reusing parts like Legos. So if you have access to building your own frames, power units, or universal rotors like this life-size thing. You can build a life-size tractor like this. And the modularity is captured, uh, you see here in the picture, uh, the drive for the, the, this trencher unit is the same unit that's on the wheels of the tractor. It's the same module. So radical modularity gets you to build things fast. Or this is a smaller tra uh, micro tractor, which is a power cube, the power unit and the tract version, much smaller, a walk-behind tractor. 
But the way you can do this, you can break down, just like Linux has uh, succeeded in software by breaking down a whole complex kernel into many, many parts, we can do the same with, with hardware. And that's exactly what we do. We break each machine down into modules. So this is the modularity concept. And then we can develop each module according to many steps, like 20 development steps or so. So this modularity concept really applies that you can take a lot of people working at the same time, not to just only to design, but also to build. But further, you can get into the idea of a construction set approach. If you have these modules, um, well, then you, you can produce a tractor, a bulldozer, a backhoe, or whatever, or a car with similar modules. But that kind of method applies not only to mechanical things, but other things like, like electronics, like uh, fabrication equipment. So we turn everything into a construction set. So instead of building one thing in a design effort, you can build a hundred things because they have the similar modules. So what does modularity allow you to do? We found that uh, one, one amazing result is the radical reduction of prototyping time from months to days. So I show this example. This is an iron worker machine. It's a metal cutting machine. You can cut one by 12 inch slabs of steel with it. The blue machine here took us six months. We redesigned it for modularity and the machine in the corner on the right hand side still cuts one by 10 inch steel. We built that in two days with two people. Radical difference. Moving on. Uh, using these methods of modularity and breaking down machines into modules, we can build things very rapidly. So for example, the brick press, we achieved the first ever build in 2011, or 2011, 2012, I think, of the full, full scale CEB machine in one day with 12 people. So each team worked on a module and then we assembled it rapidly into place. So this one day rapid manufacturing of real life size stuff is real. And okay, so next milestone, scalability. Uh, so here we show actually our small printers. We actually make and sell these. But the point here is that we design our stuff to scale. So here you see a five, uh, eight millimeter rod universal axis for 3D printers. You can make a larger printer with it. Or you can make, that's the original uh, eight millimeter version with a 25 millimeter version. Same idea, larger size. So you can build a larger machine like a CNC torch table. Or you can even increase that to 50 millimeter uh, moving parts, two inch sh heavy shafts to make a heavy duty uh, milling machine like this. This is not finished. But to give you the idea of scalability, yes, you can do it. Design it so you can scale things in a radical way. So I, I don't know if we should take questions at any time, but I mean, maybe, maybe we can wait till the end because I, I got kind of a lot of stuff to cover. So maybe take notes if you'd like and then ask me everything at the end. We'll, we'll have plenty of time, like 20 minutes probably to, to, um, uh, go go over questions so the next thing we found out that you can also do real-time documentation we've had like for example during the build of the iron worker machine the, the machine that cuts steel we had a remote team through google google hangouts uh, we were taking pictures and uploading it in real time and we had a instructional done at the same time as the build that's very powerful because a lot of times you lose the ability to you just don't document because it takes twice the effort uh, needless to say, all the hardware, open hardware work, it's, it's a lot of work from building to documenting and everything. And then we're going to get into the enterprise, which is the even next level. So we also learned about swarm builds. This is not us. That's the Amish building a big barn in a day uh, or a couple of days. We do this. We build this seed eco home. This is actually where I live. This is, this is my house where I'm presenting from right now. Um, we build that in five days with 50 people. Once again, modular design. Uh, you might not see that here, but this is panelized design. Most of the, the parts here in this house are four by eight modules that you build in a workshop and then assemble rapidly into place. So once again, the swarm build concept, that's what we do. You can see that for lower, uh, smaller structures like some of the older uh, compressed earth block structures. It requires very careful planning of the workflow. Uh, we've done um, a lot of work on that, how to do that. So in our last build, this is actually a build of a micro house in Belize Wow, we were, that was actually a good milestone because here we showed how with very careful planning, we had all the b bricks lined up on pallets. We had a big thing of uh, slurry, mortar mixed in a drum by a tractor and we could lay these bricks a few, uh, like laying them against the back stops a few seconds per block. So we got to this extremely rapid way to do this. So if you, if you actually kept that, that rate up, and of course we didn't because, you know, we're still figuring things out. We could build a house like this, like the entire walls, walls in like an hour or two, 
if you have enough people. You can have a bunch of people on each side. Uh, but this is real. You can do very rapid, rapid building. So that's the Belize house with our team. Uh, that was a five-day build just this this February. Um, well, next thing. So next milestone. We we learned about product ecologies. So the way we design the whole Global Village construction set is is for machines that make machines. It's a familiar concept with Fab, Fab Academy, uh, the Fab Labs. So you start with a printer. You make parts for larger machines like the torch table, and then the torch table can cut steel to make larger machines like tractors and brick presses. Uh, so that's a basic product ecology of machines making machines, but also, I mean, machines go for ecological uses, like we build these aquaponic greenhouses. You can use the 3D printer to print the towers. You have the panelized construction, like you see the, the ceiling and the walls here are panels. That's the modular design. You can use the backhoe to dig the, the trenches, the, the, the ponds here and so forth. So you can, you can uh, build at lower cost and affordably. Uh, and this is one of the products we're trying to get out to the market to actually make this a replicable way to, to build this. But let's talk, o talk also about um, lifetime design. If you have open blueprints, uh, radically open blueprints, uh, you can see how everything is done. So you can talk about lifetime design because you know how to fix it for a whole life. And you can talk about the circular economy. So here we're showing some of the other machines of the Global Village construction set. Like right here we've got the, um, the shredder. So you can shred your car's tractors and plastic and you can melt, melt the metal or melt the plastic and extrude it into 3D printing filament or virgin steel to then make more machines in a circular way. So actually the whole Global Village construction set consi consists of uh, the tools that are able to take you from scrap materials like say scrap steel to virgin steel and then to a modern economy with precision machining and so forth so that's all about the circular economy let's make that happen on a smaller scale uh, in our communities so next thing uh, all this boils down to we've discovered that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale you may have heard me say that in the TED talk and that's absolutely right. I talk about building a tractor in six days in the TED Talk. We've done much better. We've built a tractor in one day. For example, to um, plant out, you see the fields back there. We planted out a bunch of hazelnuts. Uh, we built a purpose-built tractor just to plant that out um, in one day with like four people. And then we actually took the tractor apart for uh, to make other tractors and other machines. So um, industrial productivity is feasible on a small scale. And there are no limits to that, really. If you look at it, what can we do? The same dirt that you see here making block, that's aluminosilicate, that can be used to make, uh, to, to make sil uh, aluminum. So aluminosilicate, uh, aluminum is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. If you have a machine to extract aluminum from clay, you can make your own metals from the dirt and twigs be beneath your feet. So we're talking about Abundant resources, abundant energy, abundant energy as in uh, there's 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun than we use today. So there's plenty of energy, plenty of materials. We're saying how do we make a better world for everyone by doing that. And talking about high tech on a small scale, you can even do this. You can see this video that's Dan Gelbart. If you, some of you might have seen this guy. You can make this precision air bearing lathe in your workshop. You can get all the parts for this. This is a super precise lathe that allows you to make air bearings, which are used in high, high speed, say, vacuum pumps that get you to clean room technology and making engines and rocket ships and all that. So we have the access to this amazing technology on a small scale, um, and we're working with that. But, but the final frontier, like, okay, why don't we have prosperity for everyone? Um, the, so, so I'll talk about here now the, the, the big limit of open hardware that we've seen so far is getting people to show up. You know, we've done some things, but all the time it's been, it's been a struggle uh, to get people to show up. So how do you get people to show up? Uh, because it takes a tremendous amount of effort to take, it from a, take something from a design to a product and a marketable product. Like here, this is the house I live in here. That's the Sidika home. We're trying to turn that into a product that you can get at a low cost. But I'm going to mention the concept of uh, what I've identified as the, uh, I call it the open source hardware trap. Um, that is that open source hardware is not efficient at making products. So take a look at, and I think the, the CNC router is the prototypical example. Count the number of router projects, CNC router projects that have been out there that have thousands of them that never actually end up making a real product. It's still hard to find a decent CNC router that you can make as an open source product. Uh, but the idea is you get to a certain place of development, 
then then you you find out that wow it takes not only like a couple of prototypes or three prototypes but but like a dozen or a hundred prototypes to get something to completion it's a lot of work if you make the analogy to software how many bug fixes do people make when they release a piece of code thousands well a similar similar anal an analogy applies to hardware you have to do a lot of prototyping like a dozen so you got a product so uh, the open source hardware trap is the fact that uh, the typical user or developer will do something and make a half-assed product and then kind of give up it's too hard too many t tries to to get it to completion and then the next person comes along uh, starts reinventing the wheel because the, typically the documentation is not really good and the people don't care about documenting and they end up reinventing the wheel getting to a certain product and it quits never finishing so thousands of prototypes are made none of them come to completion and eventually the the proprietary corporate guy says oh I'm just gonna put in a million bucks to finish a product and sell it well uh, it probably takes many millions of of so-called wasted open source effort where people don't end up with products but I call that the open hardware trap we don't have the good tools and techniques to take products to an efficient development process in hardware even though like the 3d printers open source 3d printers they have dominated the landscape like Prusa printers well but that's still um, people kind of haven't noticed that and certainly the open pr open development is not the norm okay so so here we talk about let's talk about solutions to that let's talk about distributive enterprise so what if we now focus on taking what we have and this, so this is the concept uh, myself and Colby have written about it in innovations journal um, this is about making enterprise that you're designing the enterprise to be replicated and you're teaching others freely to do that that's called free enterprise the idea that you're trying to level the playing field by opening up all your blueprints and not only on the technology side but on the enterprise side let's do it because if you think about it if we got all the effort together of the open source developers you could with enough eyeballs you can make a product you know that fix all the all the bugs are shallow right um, so clearly you can make better products if everyone collaborated but yet we compete and we're in a proprietary economy uh, run by patents so but I mean software has shown otherwise right so why aren't we doing this for hardware so we're, so here's some of the milestones we have reached so far we can for example build machines like the brick press uh, we can charge people for a workshop experience immersion uh, welding training kind of a workshop experience we can sell the machine so we've done this like we can t turn like ten thousand dollars over a weekend 5,000 from selling the machine and say 5,000 from tuition from people we've done that a couple of times it's not a replicable model yet it takes a lot of work to prepare it but this is a point of enterprise development this could be done like I, I could definitely see a possibility where you come into a workshop setting you build a product you can take it home with you and that's a viable economic model we're working on that we've done that for 3d printers like 12 people that build a 3d printer in a day uh, so there's a revenue model there you can charge over the bill of materials cost and make a sustainable business out of that or um, with the house house builds our goal I mean we've run a workshop where um, the amount of people that showed up I mean people paid us to do this so we got 25k in revenue from the workshop which paid for half the materials of this but can we take this further to make a viable economic model to, to build houses like that and that's the next question how do you take that house which still isn't fully documented actually you know we we did a Kickstarter on on the CD Eco home in 2016 we couldn't really get the documentation out we kind of failed on that part uh, but we're actually taking it again and based on the learnings but we need the people to show up okay so let's talk extreme enterprise so what is this idea so um, we're gonna take on a project where we take our CD Eco home and attempt to turn it into a product um, in a rapid development event. Sorry, there's a noise here. Let me close it. Um, okay, sorry about that. So, uh, the core of the extreme enterprise concept. We know that in all our open hardware work, it's really, really hard to get to the finished product level. So, here's our plan okay let's take a look at Linux first Linux actually started uh, with a guideline that uh, when Linux uh, to Linux started the uh, Linus started by saying he got he has to make it work fast simple thing that can be used to run most software and uh, Linus has achieved that this is so this is the history in 1991 
when Linux first originated by Linus Torvalds. And in one year, he had a program, a, a Unix equivalent that could run most Unix software. Okay, one year. So that's, that's a comparison for baseline. So what have we been able to do so far? Well, Linux currently actually enjoys about 2,000 full-time developers. Well, uh, it used to be that the, all the developers were uh, volunteers initially, but now all the developers on Linux are pretty much getting paid by Microsoft, Facebook, and all that. That's a big, big success story. Uh, all the big companies understand that open source is eff effective. So there's about 2,000 people today that are developing Linux full-time, getting paid. Now the key there is enterprise, the money that gets to pay these people. What do we do for hardware with that? Well, so I'll, I'll po point you to a data point on our side. This is design sprints from Open Source Ecology 2013. I pulled this off the Open Source Ecology wiki. Well, look at our numbers. We had uh, in our design sprints, which are remote uh, development events, 20 people at most, five minimum. I mean, well, it's hard to get people to show up. You guys probably know that. So. This is actually the state of completion after a decade of development. So these are all the machines. There's a few that are at the 100% level. Like right now, you can take the 3D printer, the actual CD cajon. That's a, f I mean, it's, the documentation is, is there. It's all the blueprints are actually there. It needs better documentation. The brick press, the power cube, micro tractor, those things are pretty much ready for prime time in terms of starting enterprise. Um, so from 2014 to 2018, we've, we've increased a little bit, but no, this is not like uh, Linux where in one year they had a product. Here, our product is the new operating system for civilization. Like how do we collaborate on product development? So that's a bigger problem. Uh, and we must say that hardware is not like 10 times harder or even 100 times harder. I think hardware is actually 1,000 times harder. It gets into physical realities, not pushing electrons around. Uh, so, what do we do for getting products to the finish line with open hardware? Well, let's start by the open source breakdown on the design front for the product. So, I, I showed this. We break machines down into product into modules and then we develop on them. And then, let's develop the enter enterprise side at the, at the same time. So, that needs more people. But you can break down an enterprise just like you, like enterprise development could, could be the equivalent of a of a product development process. So let's start by defining what that looks like. So you have to develop the product, the production, the marketing, sales and support, improvement. Um, so starting with unique value proposition, product strategy, business plan, production, quality control, marketing, web page, product assets, shipping, customer feedback, support, future work. I mean, you can break this down and, and start developing this. So our idea is, what if we pull together 2,000 people over one weekend to do this? Okay, so we have to start with a big, hairy, audacious goal. A house is of high interest. So now we're saying, okay, based on our experience with a CD home and all the other builds we have, we believe we can produce a thousand square foot home that you can build with a friend in one week for $50,000. Okay, that sounds, that's, that's competitive. Um, the average house cost in America is much higher. Our goal here is to do at least one-third the cost of industry standards. Uh, there is a catch, I'll talk about this, but this is our milestone. Can we attract people for that? I think so. So we create a weekend ev event, kind of like a startup camp or a hackathon, but souped up and taken to the next extreme. So if you have 2,000 people show up um, 24 hours on a weekend, that's 24,000 hours, e equivalent of 12 human years in one weekend. So the challenge is, how, how can you coordinate that? It's a hard challenge. Now, what we envision is taking this CD home and the modular construction method for building houses. So you can look up, uh, actually, Open Building Institute, Google that. It's in the links in the presentation. You can actually uh, see it in the presentation notes. Um, but the idea is create the, bi the, the Bible, the, you know, the big publication, probably about 2,000 pages that walks you through the complete build and enterprise of how you build these houses. 2,000 pages might be a little short, but that, that's about a page per person on, on average. So, so like if you pack all this effort into this sh short time, that's a possibility. So how do you turn this impossible project into possible? Um, well, first, everyone who participates in this extreme event gets a chance to buy this house for $50,000. We're solving for why people are not showing up, and that is the product. 
So can we actually get to that product in this crazy weekend? Let's move on. So I'm at, uh, I am have about 10 more minutes. Uh, so let's talk about what this would take. So what we see right now, and this is a new idea. It's been around for a month, but we're very excited about this and moving forward. Um, about four months of preparation time to, to line up the, the concept and launch the project. Uh, then for about the next six months, we will recruit people. So basically we're saying we've got this, this development architecture, role architecture of what all the things that need to be done lined up. And you can take that through an agile development process and come out with a product on the other side. So it once again relies on this radical breakdown of tasks to every single task that's required to do this. We can break the house down into modules. Now fortunately a house is um, not too bad. We've built a few, but you only need four things. You got a foundation, you got a floor, you got walls, and you got a roof. Okay, four modules right there. Well, there's more. There's the PV system, there's the water system, there's the toilet, there's the kitchen, there's the heat, utility connection, some other things. But you can start with a modular breakdown and then deploy teams on each, each one of them at the product level and the enterprise level. So, so far, I'm not really hearing anybody but us talk about the distributive enterprise concept. And this is a call out to anybody, talk to us. We're looking for people who believe in developing a business model that's then shared openly and believing that collaboratively we can do better. The idea that the business solves for a bigger problem. And what problem are we solving for here? This is affordable housing. This is about land speculation. Like, how do you take this house if we build it at low cost? What takes people from then speculating on that in the market and then having the same problem of housing being unaffordable? Well, let's tackle this problem together. Together, we can come up with a solution. So we develop both on the technology side and an innov innovative business model that can deploy this all over the world, starting with America here. Um, but anyway, for the organizational part, what we see is um, to onboard, like you're going to have to get everybody on board to a common development pla platform. And that is, it's, it's not too bad. It's, we know that wikis work, like Wikipedia. We have FreeCAD open source 3D design software. We have live editable docs, such as Google Docs or Etherpad, but with a ba very basic infrastructure and templates on the wiki and other other tools of modular breakdown which exist. I'm not going to go into that. We're, we're confident that kind of process can exist. So can we get the people to show up? Yes. Can we onboard them? Well, uh, I think it would take four full-time people for about six months to spend about two hours each with each person to understand exactly uh, what we're doing and where to put the documentation of one, once we develop. And so say one person develops a blender animation to show how the house goes together or an instructional or the design for the updated uh, photovoltaic system bill of materials and stuff like that there's a thousand roles right um, you can line those roles up and have people execute and each person has to produce like one or two pages of assets that are then put together into a publication that's another product uh, available for free but uh, you can break this down radically into a, a thing that's actual, actually a tractable project. project. So two hours, uh, we select people very deliberately for all the skill sets. Uh, we're not going to be just like open call, anybody show up, it's a wild, wild house. No, we're going to need to be very careful. We're going to architect the, the uh, collaboration architecture very carefully so we have all the roles showing up. Um, to develop the, the things that we need. I kind of call it the agile waterfall because it's kind of top-down scripted like waterfall development, um, but it's agile in that it's completely editable by everybody. It's completely collaborative. Like if we learn new things during the process, we switch course. We have an initial outline, but we're all after a common product, a, a, a affordable home that's modular that you can build as modules of 250 square foot modules um, for a thousand square foot house that's four modules like that okay but yeah it requires that everyone gets on board primarily to the collaborative literacy aspect how do people know what to develop where to put it once they develop it how do you manage conflicts of people submitting things all those tools exist wikis um, version control standard techniques I'm not going to go into that right now 
but let's let's talk about okay so let's talk about this 50k house product uh, is that for real well uh, here's the catch um, so what we envision is that we develop a product that can be dropped shipped as a kit that you can build in a week with a friend but here's the catch uh, there is a little bit of catch to, to do this in a week uh, it's a modular house, so what, what happens is you can build a few panels and stash them like over every weekend. So like this house here is made up of 4 by 8 panels primarily. Uh, so you have to do that for about 32 weeks. Uh, so actually the, the numbers for a 1,000 square foot house, you'd have to do 32 weeks, 8 hour weekend, if you're working by yourself. If you get 4 friends, then you're spending 2 hours every weekend, and after 32 weeks you've got all the panels for the house. Bam. Here's the other catch, BYOL, bring your own land. Sorry, land price is not included, but in America at least, I can talk Google's Zillow.com right now. You've got parcels from three to $20,000 everywhere. It may be in a most undesirable place in the country, in the US, it could be the ghetto, it could be in the middle of a desert, but that's all the definition of how, what's desirable. A desirable thing for one person may be not desirable for another and completely undesirable package might be completely desirable for somebody else like for example if you're a telecommuter it doesn't matter if you get a three thousand or ten thousand dollar plot of land somewhere uh, as long as you have internet and a ups truck so trust me there's a look at i mean you'd be amazed i, I just googled zillow the other day zillow.com plenty of parcels in big cities chicago trenton new jersey san diego two hours from san diego a plot of land for eight thousand uh, dollars you google it there's a lot of land and i can't say about other countries except like maybe in in spain you can get a whole village for for a hundred thousand dollars i don't know but yeah there's going to be opportunities to get land you have to we have to address that too um so the next step is we still need a house all right well we're going to need to develop that we we have good prototypes that we're confident we can build i to me personally i think the business side of developing this is hard uh, i think the house technology is quite tractable based on the ergonomics that we have seen of building structures like this um, so let's talk about baselines of, of structure if you go through the numbers you can check my math here but each module for 250 square feet costs six thousand dollars so that's twenty four thousand dollars in materials that includes a, a helical pier foundation which is a good way to go so the the bottom line is as i mentioned uh 32 eight hour weekends with one person that you build all these modules at six thousand dollars per 256 square foot house unit that's made of 32 modules uh, take a look at this now that's twenty four thousand dollars we still need more things like probably five thousand dollars in pv system um a few more ticket items like bathroom kitchen appliances and stuff which add up to another ten or fifteen thousand dollars but i think the budget looks pretty good that uh, altogether we need to make this model work out for around fifty thousand dollars so the the process we go through here is uh we talk about oc specifications modularity scalability eco all these features of being easy to build designed for a lifetime and made human-centric uh, appropriate technology so we we then create the requirements for all the modules we create a few products so so out of this comes the house product it might be some modeling kits it might be a book it might be training for entrepreneurs it might be uh, training for, for consultants and training for OSE chapters we'd like to actually use this as a way to deploy open source ecology chapters throughout the world that, are, that can actually produce these houses um, so after got you got a product strategy you do role architecture for each product and then you develop the, all the enterprise modules and the technology modules so this is kind of like the, the big picture overview here um, so basically if you have a module as long as you know how it fits with other modules then you're good to go that's called module-based uh, design. That's called interface design. You, you design both the interface and the module so you know how things fit together. So therefore, if another person is working on another module, they know how it all fits together. Okay, so I've got like about five minutes left here, and I'll stop talking and take questions. But okay, so I'm going to go a little bit into the enterprise role architecture. So, so here, the product design, that's pretty standard. Product development methodology or you can actually Google open source product design or some other seminal work on product design and there's a bunch of steps you have to take. So that's, that's the product design team. That's the 20 or 40 steps you take to develop each product from a concept to a, a, a built and tested product. 
the green here is the technology side. All this other stuff is I'm starting to talk about enterprise. Okay, what's the product? What's the tooling? What's the certification for builders? Business plan, supply chain, publishing, technical documentation, uh, brand, open source franchise, marketing strategy, admissible vendors list, more stuff, inventory control, quality control, fa facility design, uh, workshop model, shipping, packaging, continuing improvement, blah, blah, blah. You've got a lot of different things on the enterprise side and you can continue, you can keep breaking this down um, to various roles that we have to get pretty granular about and fit people into these roles. Um, and um, so you've got, on the technology front, you've got a lot of different assets. I mean, it's technical design and documentation primarily. There's CAD involved, there's graphics, there's animation, there's technical writing, there's, there's construction uh, skills that people who know how to design construction things so architects and others so there's a lot of work to be done now how does this work for how do you how we how do we deliver this uh, so say we show up for this 2,000 person event over a weekend this is remote by the way because it's COVID time so it's actually a good opportunity and we're looking at a schedule of uh, this uh, one year from now 10 months 10 months to a year from now for deploying this challenge um, so the event produces the know-how right that's that's information um, and then there's training so we're separate we're being deliberate about where the products here being there's information there's education and then there's actual product proper the hardware the house but there's products around education that can be created and products around information not really around information information is typically free but education if it takes your time to train people you can charge for that um, so we develop the information and training materials during the 2000 person weekend event. Uh, out of that, there's going to be a, a longer immersion program for entrepreneurs. So in that 2000 people, we'd like to have 100 to 200 entrepreneurs that are going to actually deliver these houses to your doorstep through a dropship of all the parts that you could get to build in 32 weekends either in two or eight hours, depending if you have any friends <laughs> or if you're doing it yourself even. But it's actually doable by yourself if you can spend eight hours every weekend and then get a per person to help you on a week of build out. Uh, so the way, way we do this is we, we're planning on, uh, so all the entrepreneurs in the development event, we give them leads to, give them five or 10 of the houses to de deliver. They can get paid for that, right? That there's revenue, there's, there's a business model involved in this. Um, some of the entrepreneurs, we'd like to have them start OSE chapters and get certified according to OSE specifications, meaning all the, all the values that open source ecology harbors uh, to, to be part of the open source ecology movement as we expand and now have staff and all that. Because right now it's all been volunteers and not having a team. That's been a per per persistent issue with volunteers. Um, but once you train entrepreneurs, you have to address defection as well people who are going to leave your team right because uh they can once you have this amazing information you can just make probably more money not making affordable housing but making expensive housing because probably market will bear that that's an issue that has to be addressed and i think the way to do that um is to make sure that we train enough people and continue the development of the product that there's enough supply of affordable housing that you actually have a, a person out in the market looking for a house has a viable choice between an affordable house that we can provide or a speculative house much more expensive so that's a big question here because um, we're, tr we're going for a big problem and that is affordable housing so we're going to need all the help we can get it's a problem that I cannot solve myself you may not be able to solve yourself if we invite 2,000 people as a start and then the whole world to boot because we're ethical and transparent and this is a model to provide real service to humanity then we can do it uh, so there's no free lunch here this is this is going to be some serious work some serious innovation um, what else um, so the execution is we're looking at 2,000 houses Wow that's pretty huge uh, so there's a three-day extreme enterprise event one year from that, uh, the uh, probably a few months after that, the entrepreneurs they're gonna have in the crew, the 200 entrepreneurs are gonna have to have more training. You have to know about how to build the house exactly, 
uh, how to source the parts. You have to have a much deeper understanding. That's more immersion housing. But within the first year after the Extreme Enterprise event, uh, we, we'd like to develop, develop uh, deploy, uh, build the thousand houses uh, with 200 people. So that's about five or 10 houses per entrepreneur. That's kind of how we're looking at it. And then after we train more people, deliver the next thousand houses over the second year. So that's kind of rough. I mean, these are ideas that we haven't really vetted yet, but that's roughly the schedule here. So uh, participant track, 1,800 participants, 200 entrepreneurs, key to execution, and then chapters training. Uh, so this is 50,000 for a house that you build with a friend in one week. Um, bring your own land, financial model. Uh, we want to get the price down to 50K. I think it's doable, and we have to develop an enterprise model around that. Uh, so the challenges in this, it's not going to be easy to coordinate 2,000 people, onboard them, primarily onboard them. Once we show up for those three days, do we have enough information and awareness and placeholders and templates to, to do everything? Uh, then, of course, you've got the enterprise detail, which, as I mentioned, I think is the harder part. I think the technology of the house itself is the easier part. Um, and the question of speculation afterwards, like if we develop this open source affordable house, will people actually use that to speculate with and just sell it at high cost? We're going to have to resolve that. Here's a link to the role architecture. Well, so next steps for us right here are detailed house budget. You saw a, a rough figure of 6,000. We're going to get that to the dollar uh, in a week or two. Uh, detailed house budget, detailed enterprise model, blank page to be developed. Uh, so that's about all I have. You can find out more about um, if you want to be. OK, so you guys are listening to you're probably interested in this and helping out. Or participating in this so definitely um, you can sign up for our newsletter opensourceecology.org uh, you can email me for more info marching at opensourceecology.org otherwise I'd like to take questions and feedback on this crazy idea yeah hi Marcin uh, 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 there have been a lot of questions now uh, yeah uh, I request everyone uh, whosoever wants to uh, come uh, on the video can uh, uh, can actually enable the video option and ask the question directly. Is there anyone who wants to start or should I s start taking the questions from start? Yeah, who wants to start? Questions, questions. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, so I go one by one. Uh, here, uh, Pete is asking, do you have specification for the interfaces that you initially showed? Um, there's details. No, the the short answer is no. But yes, you can derive those. No, I'll, I'll keep it at a no because we've done a, an interface design and we found enough about it that we're gonna have to. We know we have to modify it. So at present, no. But you can definitely look at what we have before. So you have that in your documentation. Uh, yeah, we do. The best place to look at it is that is, is the Seed Eco Home page on the wiki. So. Okay. Uh, I can provide all those links for people, but if you look at my presentation, uh, there should be a link there. CD Home Index. Okay, uh, then Philip is uh, asking, scaling up seems uh, possible, but what about scaling down? Uh, mm -hmm. He comments that at a, po at a point in time, it will require really specialized and expensive plants, example CPU, LCD, fiber optics, sometimes there is just one or two suppliers on the entire planet. So what do you think about that? I see. So is this for the at the level of the house or in general? Uh, it looks like in general. Philip, if you are there, uh, you can ask a question directly. Okay. The answer to that is... Uh, sorry, I'm... Tr okay, here we go. Um, the answer is that we're scaling for both up and down. So we're designing for literally the desktop, starting with a desktop microfactory up to a 4,000 square foot workshop. But we, we operate really at the village level, which says, okay, essentially a 4,000 square foot microfactory can produce most things that a village scale would need. And many villages are a city. But if you scale down, yeah, there's, there's tiny things that you can build, like with 3D printers, a torch table, or just a manual torch and basic equipment. There's a lot of stuff you can build. The key is really the access to the open source machines that can get you to that productivity. If you talk about scarce suppliers, well, 
that needs to be developed too. Like currently we're working on making plastic fully recyclable so you can make your 3D printing filament, something you can do on your desktop scale. But for more advanced things, there's gonna be b possibly bigger machines. But if you examine any, any process that's out there in the industrial world, like the per let's look at the air bearing lathe. That is like the best example where with that you can start manufacturing clean room equipment. You've got, you know, you build structures with a brick press and construction equipment. You populate it with clean room equipment to make microchips. So you can go both up and down in scale. And the thing about technology is the concept of miniaturization. Right now with digital fabrication you can do things at an unprecedented small scale. So you can be the next John Deere tractor manufacturing right right in your workshop with a CNC torch table and a welder. That's literally true. So you can go both up and down in scale. Uh, and uh, Kevin uh, asks, uh, how did you secure the financing for this uh, massive project? Uh, by the way, absolutely awesome work. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are we talking about the house or now just all the, all throughout? I mean, all throughout, we have uh, been bootstrap funded. It's We've only had a budget of about $1.4 million to date over the decade uh, from foundations. And right now it's true fans, crowdfunding, like we did some Kickstarters. But right now it's programmatic revenue, running workshops and selling our 3D printers and now rolling out other products. So we're bootstrap funded so that anybody can replicate it with no capital. Now, as far as the house project, how do we fund that? The people that participate. Isn't that interesting? Instead of asking people to, to uh, begging people to come, we're going to charge them. Will that work? I think so. Well, the funding model is quite innovative. There. It's kind of turning the thing upside down, reversing the, the thing. But we're saying we're going to create an event of value that produces value, and you're going to want to be there. So it's actually designed, we're aiming for a self-funding model to demonstrate that crowd-based Crowdfunded development with a vision can succeed over any capital, finance capital method. That's what we're solving for. We're saying, hey, we are going to solve for an efficient, open process that brings in the funding and has to compete. Like if, um, say, we're making cordless drills, we'd have to have that kind of a power to uh, develop something on a short time scale and that's good enough to make it happen. That's why, that's what I see as the critical missing link why open source hardware is not not really taking off but let's actually talk about prusa printers let's say as an example they have taken off they're like a 50 million dollar business i think but their enterprise is not distributive they're not teaching people how to build 3d printers and do more things it's still a centralized business and it took a long time to develop maybe a few years um so it takes a long time. There's not really good precedence of, of the distributive enterprise model where you can take a model that many other people can replicate. And that, that's actually my ask to anyone out there. People like FarmBot, Prusa Printers, Arduinos, or anybody who's got a product, let's come together and let's share the businesses so each of the businesses become better. And you have the next Amazon as a result. Open source micro factories fueled by open source uh, plans. Okay. Um. Uh. Asks, is there any effort planned to be uh, compatible with European housing rules? As a wooden house, uh, uh, as this appears, does not fulfill the energy standard required for every uh, new house build. Basically, uh, the question is around the regulations, yeah. uh, depending on the different countries. Uh, yes. So, what, what is your take on that? The answer is modular breakdown. So, we can have a modular design for the USA. We can have, if we have more participation, or maybe like, so this event will be US-centric. Because, for example, I don't know anything about the supply chain in Germany, right? Whereas I know some about the US. So, we're going to do that for the US first to manage risk and develop that as a feasible thing. But then again, so if this method succeeds, we can do this event again for Europe. Or as part of this event, if we have enough Europeans participating, they can do the codes for the European version. 
that could be a module. Here's the module for America, the, the, the basic module for America. Here's the basic module for other places. And it can be modularized down to each country. And it will have to be modularized down and localized to each country for it to be feasible. Okay. Uh, uh, I request I will tell uh, uh, Arik Babu. Uh, I'm really sorry if I'm uh, not pronouncing your yeah. name correctly. So please come on video and ask uh, uh, to uh, share your comments and ask your questions. Uh, I will. Tell yeah. Hi, Machin. Hi, Ayo. <clears throat> I, yeah, but my, my question was about the um, localization of the of the idea. Um, for example, fifty thousand US dollars is about three times what it would cost to do yeah. um, what would be considered affordable housing in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, so I was asking that. Okay, how can we how, how can we like. Um, benchmark the, the cost i'm sure yeah. it's possible to to still do it within that range but how do we verify that i know that, yeah yeah that we're we're, we're um right essentially how, how can that be done in nigeria yeah no that that's a, i also i also made a suggestion that if you're looking at making the seed echo house into into a product uh why not go all the way and look at a, a small village why not go look at creating, a, like, go all the way, get this land that he says are very good yeah. for cheap in America, yeah. and do a mini village of 50 or 100 units. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's... Uh... So you can, you, you can build in all the open source ethos into the same yeah. space and get like-minded people who want to own property exactly. with like-minded people to, you know, sort of kickstart this civilization, like we're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those, are, those are two things. Yeah. Okay, good questions. Um, so yes, the, the question we were just talking about that today about larger scale developments. Well, we want to get really good at making sure we can do one unit because once you have that, you can readily now say we've now built a few of these houses, uh, then you can go for an entire village. The, that is much more complex as a project. So I think the very, very easy place to start there's land some that's probably not in a city. It may be like outskirts of a city or close to rural. Someone's got land and they want to do it. Get a few of those done. You can readily go to that village and that's certainly the next step. But I wouldn't start with that because just for the permitting of that, if you're going to do that, uh, even if you're in the middle of nowhere, I mean, I'm not sure how that would work, but it's much harder than just a unit or a few units, but definitely in a plant. Now, we're also designing the, to address that for village scale. Each house is, first of all, scalable. It's a seed home. You build one seed, and then you can add on to it in 256 square foot modules. And we're actually considering flat roofs. You can stack on top, too. Okay? You can do that. Uh, so that actually addresses your question, like, would you be happy with a smaller house in Nigeria with the with U.S. supply chains at that cost? Well, you can either go to a smaller ho uh, house unit, or you have to work with your local supply chains. Maybe there's stuff that's much better there that you have access to. Maybe, well, first of all, you're in a tropical country, let's say. You probably don't need all the insulation or freeze-proofing that we need. So, so there's probably ways. Like for the tropical areas, yeah, you can, you can go way, way cheaper. Like in a Belize build, we'd not have to worry anything about pipes freezing or insulation. So there's, uh, I think there's ways to, to go about it, but then you definitely have to have involvement of people like yourself to say, okay, here's the, what the model, um, once again, in this event or some, some event, the extreme enterprise event, we're, we're going to work on that. Okay, so here's an event for Nigeria or where we focus on those, those aspects. It will have to be, be uh, localized to everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, next question is from Liana N. Liana N. Uh, 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 the question is, have you looked at the at Habitat for Humanity as a comparison? Yeah. Habitat for Humanity is the best best example. They're doing some impactful work and sheer sheer volume of houses that are built. We'd love to collaborate with them if we can. So we'll see how we can do that. Well, have yeah. you looked at them? Have you looked at them in terms of um, dealing with the localization question? Um, I I volunteered at Habitat 
a uh, few times back in college. I mean, I haven't particularly. But I mean, that. has there been like board level contact? That seems like, you know, there's some there's some common ground there, and they've Absolutely. solved a lot of the problems. Yeah, we got to do it. If you can connect us to any other board level people, we'd love to see that. We haven't mm -hmm. reached out like that yet. We weren't ready for it. Right now, this is probably the time to do it. Well, I'd love to learn more about what you've done so far. Uh, I was just scouting about on your other site. Yeah. So, um, well, feel free to contact me. I have a charitable organization, and uh, we have open space, open mental space for doing something along these lines. Okay. You're Leanne? I'm Leanne Newton. Leanne, okay. And um, I think you'll, there's, I assume there's a way you can contact me from just... How are you doing? Here. Am I getting a list of the participants with their emails at the end, or otherwise? Otherwise, you can find me on the Fabex community site, uh, or I'll I'll text you, I'll send you my email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In chat. Yeah, and I'm marching at opensourceecology.org. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Ian, That's great. for reading that. Um, next question is from Pete. Have you thought about regulations, uh, regulation events such as inspections or permits that require serialization of activities? Yeah, we're going to have to make it work with that. So maybe maybe the foundation gets done and inspected ahead of time. That This is all to be developed in a legal section. And there are restrictions to that by all means. You might have to have certain parts inspected. But if we say you build this with a friend over one week, well, you might have to do half a week today and... Half, an, half a week, a month from then, after inspection. So that's still compatible with this kind of model. If we're doing a model where we had the five-day window, like in our extreme builds, no, you cannot address the inspection model that well there. But with this model, you can, because you can phase things out, space things out. Okay. So with that, uh, uh, all the questions then I, I do want to ask you, uh, Martin, one yeah. question. Uh, it's it's uh, the software tooling, or rather, the mechanism around uh, this whole plan, as in, uh, the, uh, I mean, it's most of the time the time spent on the supply chain and uh, uh, the transactions and the acquire uh, and getting things acquired, uh, especially in uh, countries which are developing countries, uh, they take a lot of time. So, how do you sort of uh, plan to build on the st software stack uh, to support? your plans uh, software stack well right now our software stack is very primitive it's it's wikis freecad I mean wiki can be scalable we don't have anything advanced and I also think that not using anything advanced but simple accessible tools I don't see the limit of that to be able to handle the kind of population that we need we're gonna need a conference that uh, a conference call that handles 2,000 people we're going to need a wiki that handles 2,000 people, and we're going to need editable docs, which clearly they with Google Docs you can have thousands of people. So, but once again, modular. Like each thing is a separate entity. Like in the modular design, you have many different websites you go into. Um, I, I don't think that that's, that's a main challenge. After we get good at what we're doing here, we can probably talk about a customized, specialized platform for this. But right now, this is so wild and agile that I think to do something like you're suggesting in terms of a specialized stack to handle this is excessive at this point. That's my opinion on a topic. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, I think uh, the questions are uh, finished now. And, okay. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I uh, I ask everyone uh, if they want to leave any contact details, please post on the chat, or maybe uh, they can contact you on your email ID that you posted. Um, yeah. Okay. With yep. that, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being awesome. a good audience, and look forward to making this happen. Okay. <laughs>